Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering InterConnect 2017. Brought to you by IBM. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Las Vegas for IBM InterConnect 2017. Silicon Angle's theCUBE's exclusive coverage of IBM InterConnect. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next two guests, Eric Herzog, Vice President of Market for IBM Storage. Good to see you again, you were on yesterday. Uh, and Mark Odo, who's the Manager of Customer Success and Partners of Spark Cognition, a customer. Guys, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you again. Welcome for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what's the, what's the deal? We're going to talk about some storage we did yesterday, but you've got the customer here. What's the relationship? Why are you guys here? So, we provide a, the storage platform. They use our flash technology. Uh, Spark is a professional software company. It's not a custom house. They are a software company. And Spark, not related to Spark, open source. Just the name Spark, Spark Cognition. Spark okay, Cognition, Just make sure you get that yes, out of the way. Yeah. Go ahead, continue. So, they're a hot startup. They have a number of different use cases, including cybersecurity, real-time IoT, predictive analytics, and a whole bunch of other uh, things that they do. And they, when the customer goes on-premise, because they deliver either through a service model or on-premise, when it's in their service model, they use our flash and our power servers. When it's on-premise, they recommend, here's the hardware you should use to optimize the software if the customer buys an on-premise version. But they offer it both ways. But part of the reason we thought it would be interesting is they're a professional software company. A lot of the people here, as you know, are regular developers, in-house developers in this case. These guys are a well-funded, VC startup that delivers software to the end user base. So tell us more about Spark Cognition. Give us the highlights. Yeah, appreciate it. So Spark Cognition, we're a cognitive algorithms company. We, we do uh, data science, <laughs> machine learning, uh, natural language processing, uh, kind of the whole, the whole gambit there. Um, working, we have three products. Uh, Spark Predict is our predictive analytic, uh, predictive maintenance uh, product. Spark <laughs> Secure is our network log security product. And Deep Armor is a machine learning endpoint protection product. So in that, you kind of hear we're in the IOT, the industrial IOT, the IIOT of things, uh, and also in, in cybersecurity. Uh, we've done use cases and other machine learning use cases as well, but the predictive maintenance and the cybersecurity are our two most, uh, most advanced use cases, uh, industrial areas. Um, so uh, we've, been, we've been around about three years. We have around 100 people. I uh, appreciate Eric uh, talking about how, how well financed we are and how, uh, how our, our success is, uh, really is, is budding thus far. And we're, we're happy and to be here. And where are you guys located? Uh, we're based out of Austin, Another Texas. Another Austin. Yeah, yeah, Austin, Texas. <laughs> Okay, you're dominant with Austin. So it's good to have financing. You can't go out of week. business if you, don't, if you don't run out of money. Um, <laughs> talk about the industrial aspect of it. One of the things that uh, is hot, and it's not a mainstream conversation here, is blockchain's the big announcement, but IOT is a big one. But industrial IOT is interesting because now you have the digitization of business um, as a big factor, and that data is going to be thrown off massive analog digital data now, so analog to digital. What's yeah. going on there? What are you guys doing there to help and where does the storage fit in? Yeah, I appreciate that. So, um, so IIoT, industrial, it's, it's obviously there's, there's big clients there. There's a lot of value in this information. Um, so for us, it's uh, predictive maintenance is, is the big play. Uh, a, a study I read the other day by Boston Consulting Group talks about how you know, it, it services and applications and the industrial internet of things, there's an $80 billion market in the next five years uh, with predictive maintenance leading the way as the most mature uh, application there. So we're happy to be kind of riding on the front of that wave, really pushing the, the state of the art there. Um, so predictive maintenance is valuable to clients because you know, the idea is to pr predict failures, do optimization of, of resources, so to get more energy out of your wind, your wind farm, get more gas out of the ground, you name it. Um, so having the, having the software that can provide those solutions efficiently to clients, um, you know, without, without a lot of startup at each new iteration, so having a product that can deliver that uh, intellectual property efficiently is important. Um, and the whole goal is to be able to reduce maintenance costs uh, and extend the, the, the useful life of assets. Um, so that's what Spark, Spark Predict is, a, is our product. Spark Predict, our product, and Spark Cognition has been uh, laboring to do. Um, we have a successful deployment of 1,100 turbines uh, with Invenergy, which is a, uh, the largest wind production company in the United States. We're doing work with, uh, with Duke, Nextera, several other large electrical production companies, oil and gas companies as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're in Austin, we're near Houston, and we have a lot of you know, energy production uh, opportunity there. So predictive maintenance for, for us is a, is, a, is a big play. So you guys did a, did a session this week. You hosted a panel, right. is that right? Right. And so, I mean, no offense, but th what we're talking about now is really even more interesting than storage. But, so, but it's a storage panel you were hosting. Right? So, right. so what was the conversation so like? So the conversation around that was we had three software companies, 
Spark Cognition, and two other software companies. And then we had um, a federal integrator. And all of them are doing cloud delivery. So for example, one of the other software companies, Medicat, delivers medical record keeping as a service to hospitals. Okay, so they're doing predictive analytics and predictive maintenance and also some cybersecurity out. So it was three professional software companies, an integrator, and in each case, the issues were A, we need to be up and going all the time and the user doesn't know what storage we're using, but we can never fail because we're real time. In fact, one of the customers is the IRS. So the federal integrator, the IRS cloud runs on IBM storage. The entire IRS runs on an IBM cloud. Our, our, our storage, but it's their cloud. It's their private cloud that they put together that the integrator put together. So the idea was, when you've got a cloud deployment, there's two key things your storage has to do. A, it needs to be resilient as heck, because these guys and the other two companies on the software side, if they can't serve it as a service, then no one's going to buy the software, right? Because it's software as a service. So for them, it's critical in their own infrastructure that it be resilient. And then the second thing, it needs to be fast. You've got to meet the SLAs, right? So we think of the systems integrator at the IRS, what do you think the SLAs are? And they've got like 14 petabytes of all flash. You forgot dirt cheap. You got, you got resilient as heck, lightning fast, it got to be dirt cheap too. Right? Well, of course. <laughs> they won all three, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, so you, you, ha you have this panel. So Ginny, what were Ginny's three? Industrial ready, cloud based, and cognitive to the core, right? So you guys are, I'm on your website, it's cognitive this, cognitive that. So you're, you're cognitive to the core, you're presumably, you're using industrial ready infrastructure and it's all cloud based, right? Yeah. Uh, talk about that a little bit and then I got a follow up. Yeah, so um, you know, to, to, to tie into what uh, Eric is saying about the, the premium, the premium hardware, the cloud opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for us to be able to do AI software, to be able to do machine learning models, these are very intensive, uh, intensive uh, applications that require massive amounts of CPU, I/O, uh, fast storage. To be able to get those, to get that the value from that data quickly, so that it's useful and actionable takes that premium hardware. So that's why we've, we've done testing with Flash System, with our cybersecurity product. Um, you know, one of the most innovative things that we did in, you know, in, the, in the previous year was to move from a traditional architecture using x86-64, we had a cluster of eight, uh, eight servers there, brought that down to one Flash System array and were able to get up to 20 times the performance uh, with doing things like analyzing, sorting, and, and, and uh, ingesting data with our cybersecurity platform. So in, in that regard, we were very much tied closely to the Flash System uh, product. Um, so that was a very successful uh, use case. And we actually, we authored a white paper on that. If anyone wants to read more, that's available on uh, the IBM website. Where, where do you find that? Just search it. Uh, yeah, it's on IBM.com and it's basically how they used it to deliver software as a service. What do I search? Uh, if you search Spark Cognition IBM, uh, you'll right, find right, it on find Google. It. So yeah. my other question, my follow up is, <laughs> you talk about these IOT apps which are distributed by their very nature. Can we talk about the data flow? What are you seeing in terms of where the data flows? Everybody wants to instrument the windmill. Right? You got to connect it, then you instrument it. Where's the data going? You're doing analytics? locally, you're sending data back. What are you seeing in the client base? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in those, in the field use cases for the wind turbines, for example, so most of our clients, they already have a data storage solution. Like we don't, we're not a data storage provider. Uh, and the reason, someone asked me this yesterday in a different conversation, they said, why are wind turbines so much, uh, so, so ripe for the picking? And it's because they're, they're relatively modern assets. They, they, they were built with the sensors on board. The data has been, they've been collecting the data for, you know, since the, since the invention of the modern wind turbine, they've been collecting this data. Um, you know, it's, it's generally, it's sent in from the field at 10 minute intervals, usually stored in some sort of a, a large data center. Um, for, the, for our purposes though, we collect a sort of a feed off that data of the, of the important information, run our models, store a, a, a small data set, you know, a few, a few months, whatever we think we need to train that machine learning model and to retrain and balance that model. Um, so that, that's sort of an example where we're doing the analysis in a data center or in the cloud, sort of off, out of the field. The other, the other approach is sort of an edge analytics approach, you might have heard that term. Yeah, but that's sure. usually for smaller devices um, where the, the, the value of the asset doesn't justify the infrastructure to relay that information and then and deploy this large scale solution. Uh, so we actually are developing edge analytics solution, a version of our product as well, uh, working with a company called FlowServe, they're the world's largest uh, pump manufacturer company, to be able to say, how can we add some intelligence to these pumps 
that, that may operate uh, near a pipeline or out in the oil field um, and, and be able to make those machines smarter even though they don't necessarily justify the, the robust IT infrastructure of a full wind turbine fleet, so. Mm -hmm. Is there a best practice that you guys see in terms of the storage, because you bring out edge in the network. Great point, a lot of diversity at the edge now, <laughs> from industrial to people. But the data's got to be stored somewhere. I mean, is there a best practice or a pattern <laughs> developing that you're seeing uh, in terms of how people are approaching the data problem and applying the algorithms to it? And then just talk, do I move the data? Do I push the compute to the data? Thoughts on, on you, what you guys are seeing in terms of best practices? Well, so one of the other companies that was on the panel also is doing um, predictive modeling and they take 600 different feeds in real time and then munge it for um, mostly for industrial markets but mostly for the goods. So the raw goods that they need to make a machine or make a table or make the paper that is, you know, used be behind us or make the lights that are used here, they look at all that commodities and then they feed it out to all these consumers, not consumers, but the companies that build yep. these products. So for them, they need it real time. Um, so you need storage that's incredibly fast because what they're doing is they're putting it on super powerful CPUs loaded with DRAM, but you can only put so much DRAM in a server, right? And they're building these giant clusters to analyze all this data and then everything else is sitting on the flash and then they push that out to their customers. So, slightly different model from what Spark Cognition does, but a slightly similar, except they're taking in from six, 600 constant data sources in real time, 24 by seven, 365, and then feeding it back out to these manufacturing companies that are looking to buy all these commodities. You have uh, software defined in your title. Yes. Right? This was the kind of big buzzword a few years ago, and everybody kind of wanted to replicate the public cloud on-prem. <laughs> on uh, we think of it as programmable infrastructure, right? You, Set it, and then you, you can start, you know, making API a, API calls and set SLAs and you know thresholds, etc. Where are we at with software defined? Uh, do you guys does it resonate with you? Is it just an industry buzzword? But I'll start with with, with so Eric. for us, we're the largest provider of software defined storage in the world. You know, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year. We don't sell any infrastructure, we just sell the raw software, and they use commodity infrastructure, whatever they want, hard drives, flash drives, CPUs, anything they buy from their local reseller, and then create basically high performance arrays using that software. So they've created on their own, everything is built around automation, so we automatically can replicate data, snapshot data, migrate data around from box to box, uh, move it from on-premise to a cloud, through what we call transparent cloud tiering. All of that in the software-defined storage is done based on automation play. So the software-defined storage allows them to, if you will, build their own version of our flash system by just buying the raw software and buying flash from someone else, which is okay with us because the real values in the software, obviously, as you know. Um, so that allows them to then create infrastructure of their own, but they've got the right kind of software. They're not homebrewing the software. It's all built around automation. So that's what we're seeing in the software defined space across a number of different industries, whether it be cloud providers, you know, banks. We have all kinds of banks that use our software defined storage and don't buy the actual underlying storage from us, just the storage software. So do you, I mean, you may not have visibility in this, but I'm getting kind of geeky on it, but do you guys adopt that sort of software defined mentality and in your, in your approach, or? Yeah, so, um, so for us, software-defined storage is something that we've deployed uh, for our proof of concept evaluations. The, the, the nature of the work that we do is the, every, the, the, the solution is innovative to the point where everyone needs to have some sort of proof point for themselves before the company or the client will invest in a large scale. So software-defined storage in, in sort of embracing that, that perspective has allowed us to, to deploy a small-scale implementation you know, it, without having our own dedicated hardware, for example, at, at different clients. So that's, that's enabled us to, to, to spin up an instance quickly, to, to provision you know, that, 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 uh, that small-scale deployment, to be able to prove out results at a low cost to our clients. So that's, that's where we've really leveraged that approach. Um, we also have used a similar approach in the cloud where we've used multi-tenant environments to be able to uh, support our cybersecurity product, Spark Secure. Um, in a multi-tenant cloud hosted environment, uh, which you know, brings down delivery costs as well, allows us to sort of slice up that data and, and deliver it at a, at a low cost. Uh, as far as our large scale uh, uh, physical deployments, 
uh, for the asset monitoring and, and such. Um, you know, we really, we generally end up with a, a piece of a flash system or you know, flash storage, uh, bare metal deployment because that speed is critical. Uh, whether that's uh, you know, you, the client wants to have uh, you know instant monitoring of a critical asset, or they have a financial services use case where we're looking for anomalies or or looking for threats in the cybersecurity landscape. You know, having that real time uh, model model building and model result is very critical. And so uh, having that bare metal flash system type uh, installation is kind of our preferred preferred route. Um, the only other thing I would say on that is, uh, you, you asked earlier about uh, sort of our approach. Uh, so for us, the security of the data is very important. Most of our assets are what, what are called critical assets, and so clients are very sensitive to the security of the, of the, of the data, and so some are still uncomfortable with a, sort of a cloud deployment. So another reason why we have an affinity for the, the hardware deployment with, with IBM. So, so why, why IBM? Uh, so our company has really deep roots with IBM. Um, our, my, my founder, uh, uh, Amir Hussein, was actually on the board of directors of the original IBM Watson project, and uh, as well as Manoj Saxena was the, um, was the original GM of the IBM Watson program. So we have a, just a long relationship with IBM, so we have a lot of uh, mutual interest and respect for the, for the entity. Uh, we've also found that the products are superior in many ways. You know, we are, we are hardware agnostic, and you know, when we, we're an independent advisor to our clients when it comes to how to deliver our solutions, but you know, our, our professional opinion, based on the testing that we've, we've done, is that IBM is a top tier option, and so we continue to, uh, to, uh, to prescribe that to our clients when, when they feel that's appropriate, they make that, that purchase through IBM. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Great, great testimonial. Eric, excited to hear that. Nice. Testimonial for you guys. As Congratulations. Always, he, he's done several panels with us, and again, part of the reason for here was A, all about IoT, which they're all into, all about cognitive, which they're all into, and to show that you can do a software as a service model, even in house. You know, they happen to be a professional software company, but if you're a giant global enterprise, you may actually do software as a service to your remote branch offices, which is very similar to what these guys do to other companies. So this gives them an example, the other two software companies the same way, to show in-house developers, if you're going to have a private cloud, not go public, you can deliver software as a service internally to your own company through you know, the dev model and do it that way, or you can use someone like Spark Cognition or Medicat or, or the other companies that we showed, you know, Z-Power, all of which were using us to deliver their software as a service with IBM Flash technology. And you're using Watson or Watson Analytics? Or? Yeah, so we have done integrations with Watson for our cybersecurity product. Um, we've also done integrations with Watson, uh, rank and retrieve, using the NLP capabilities to advise uh, the analysts, both in the predict space and in the secure space. Um, so, sort of a, an advisor to say, you know, what a, a, a client user could see something happening on a turbine and say, you know, what does this mean? And using a Watson corpus. Um, I was going to add one thing to, we were talking about why IBM, you know, IBM really has, has been a, a leader in the space of cognitive computing and they've invested in, 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 bring, in nurturing small companies and bringing up entrepreneurs in that space to build that out and so we appreciate that. I think it's important to mention that. All right, Mark, thanks so much for joining yeah. and the great testimony, great insight and good luck with your business. Congratulations on the success. Startup, uh, taking names and kicking butt. Eric, great to see you again. Thanks for the insight and congratulations you. on your great happy customers and uh, see you again. Okay, we're watching theCUBE live here at uh, Interconnect 2017. More great coverage, stay with us. We more after this short break. <laughs>